Central, put Keith Rucker on for me, will you? Georgia BR5479. What do you mean he's too busy? You haven't even rung him yet. Oh. All right. Thank you. You know, this, this channel is uh, dedicated to steam power, preserving the technology and a little bit of knowledge about what was going on with it uh, in the uh, 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, you had your choice, either water power or steam power. That was just about it, or horses. And uh, it was really responsible for building the country back then. Almost everything uh, really useful was invented uh, in the 25-year span there. And uh, so it's kind of an important part of our history. And uh, I get a lot of questions on my propulsion system and the engine and the boiler and the piping and all that. <clears throat> so I covered all that on a lot of my earlier videos, but that was quite a long time ago. And if you knew viewers here haven't had a chance to go back and look at some of that stuff. So I'm going to just go back and backtrack some of this stuff a little at a time on every video. Uh, about the boiler, uh, it was built in 1924 by the Mundy Steam Hoist Company. Uh, I have the whole hoist. Uh, it's outside. Uh, and this was the boiler from it. Uh, it's uh, quite a heavily constructed boiler. Uh, this is a, these are called hand holes. They are just inspection holes. This boiler has 10 of them. Uh, you take these loose <coughs> and uh, the, the caps actually push from the inside out onto a rubber gasket. And uh, that's for inspecting and cleaning the boiler. Uh, the feed water, well, first off, the water in the boiler, it has to be maintained uh, about in this, this level right here. So you have a, a sight glass here, and the water stands up in the glass as a gauge. Right now it's about an inch and a half from the top. These uh, valves here are called tricocks, and they, uh, they're another way of double checking your water level. If you open them slowly, you will get either water or steam out of them. Well, that, that's got water. This has got water. And that's got water. And it tells me that the level is above the highest valve here. Uh, and a lot of in, uh, firemen get in trouble <clears throat> by not paying attention to the water level and relying on this water glass too much. It's possible for these, uh, these valves here to get plugged with sediment and scale and give you an erroneous reading here. So you really need to double check yourself every once in a while. And this valve on the bottom is to blow the water out. And if you close this valve, open this drain, the steam pressure will blow the water and sediment out the bottom and clear the glass. Um, the water has to be replenished because it's used up in the process of making steam. Uh, this boiler and setup, if I'm running the big engine for like, I'll oh, say a half hour straight, it'll run it down about maybe four or five inches in the glass. So I've got to come back here and 
and uh, turn on the injector, which uh, takes water from rainwater from my uh, barrels here, where it's stored, and I put a little bit of boiler treatment in it. And uh, it's injected into the boiler by steam pressure with these little devices here called injectors. Uh, they're kind of an amazing contraption that was invented in the late 1800s and it really was quite uh, a great thing for steam power to have injectors <clears throat> because it did away with having all the pump, the mechanical apparatus and pumps and everything and it also is quite beneficial in that it heats the water uh, quite a bit before it puts it into the boiler where with a pump you're pumping cold water into the boiler which is rough on the boiler and it brings the steam pressure down when you're doing it unless you have a feed water heater where you run the water up into the smoke stack where the, the heat is and it kind of preheats the water before it goes in but this is just a straight injector system I have two injectors on here for the redundancy idea so if one is giving trouble you got the other one both of these as far as I know work perfect uh, there are two different brands. One is a Metropolitan, and the other is a Hancock. And there are two different styles. Uh, the Metropolitan uh, will work uh, at about 35 PSI. They're both pretty low pressure injectors. Uh, and the Hancock will go down to a much lower pressure. You really shouldn't need to use them at that pressure, but it's just a, a, a trait of the injector that it will do that. Now, the injector is kind of an amazing thing, and you think, how is it possible that you can use steam from the boiler under boiler pressure to push water into the boiler under that same pressure? But it does work, and why it works and how it works is a, was an ongoing discussion amongst old engineers and firemen for years and years. I mean, it was like, it was like discussing politics. Uh, but just to briefly, simply tell you what I have read and what I, I know firsthand and what in my mind is actually happening here is you've got basically a siphon set up. And if you've ever had one of those boat balers that will bail your boat out with a garden hose, or you hook the garden hose up and a stream of water coming out will pull water in from the side, so you waste a lot of water that way, but it does pull the water out of your boat. Well, that's a siphon. And anytime you have a, 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 a liquid or a gas running through a pipe and you put another pipe on it sideways and there's a constriction in there of venturi, it will create a vacuum on this side pipe. Well, that's what happens here. You turn the steam, the water on, and you turn the steam on, and it pulls the water up. Well, what it the steam is being blown through a small orifice at a very high velocity and when that water is introduced into that stream of steam it condenses so now you have very high velocity water which has water droplets whatever you want to call it an emulsion of water which has a much higher density uh, than the steam had so that higher density has momentum and that momentum you know, it's like rolling a bowling ball down an alley as compared to a piece of cellophane or something. That bowling ball has got some energy in it because it's moving pretty fast and it drives it through to another orifice into the boiler. And that's basically what's happening. This is the Metropolitan injector and uh, the steam comes in the top from the boiler here and the water comes in the bottom through this valve and uh, to start it up you just open this one up about there there's no steam now so it's not working but at about that position it will blow some steam and water out the overflow uh, pipe which is runs down into this this pipe here which is just kind of like a funnel uh, and that runs into a drain in my uh, base of my boiler here and after a second or two the boiler will catch it'll kind of all of a sudden you hear it kind of click and the water stops and you can hear it going into the boiler uh, 
This one is called a Hancock Inspirator. And that Inspirator means basically nothing. It's just their PR name for it. Uh, and it's a two-stage injector. And uh, what it does is it has one stage that will lift the water up, like from a lower reservoir, quite a ways, like 16, 18 feet, so they claim. And then it's got uh, a second part of it that it does the actual injecting into the boiler. And it, it works similar to the other one, but it's a little more complicated to start up. You have to turn on the, the water down here and turn on the steam here and get this first injector to start lifting the water up to the injector and you'll you'll hear it and see it in the overflow when you get nice solid water coming out of there you uh, open this valve up which starts the second injector and then you have to close these two overflow valves uh, there's one there and one there in sequence this one first and then that one I had no idea how this thing worked and I found a, a manual online about it and uh, the first time I hooked it up it worked perfect and uh, it's never given me any problems. You also have a very important part of the feed water system is uh, check valves and I've had three sets of check valves on this and I've finally got two of them that work. Uh, there, it's got a little swing flapper valve in there that only lets the water go that way. It won't let boiler pressure go back that the other way. And if these things are acting a little freaky, it, it drives the injectors crazy. So you gotta make sure you have two uh, check valves. In fact, it's not a bad idea to have two check valves on each injector so you have an extra check valve in there, but I don't really have room here to do it on this setup and it's it's working pretty good now. Then this is the, the boiler feed shutoff that just shuts the boiler off from the injectors. If you have to tighten anything up or do any work on them, you can actually shut this valve off and, uh, and do that. Uh, While well, the steam is coming from the top here, to drive this whole thing and uh, the injectors and uh, this is just an extra outlet I put in there and I use it to fill the boiler I hook a hose up to this and pump it in if I have no water in the boiler like if I have drained it down to clean it or something uh, and I can also get steam out of that to uh, like to run a model engine or something if I want to this over here another part of the feed water system uh, is this system here and, and this this valve runs down here over here up the wall to this little device here which is a very cool thing it's called an ejector and it works sort of like an injector except it's made for moving water from one place to another and in this case I have it piped to my outside rainwater tank and oh this is this is the in from the rainwater tank this is the steam in and like I told you before the steam going through here will pull a vacuum on something coming up this way it's got a venturi in here to make it even more efficient so then the water with steam runs down this pipe and in this length of pipe the steam is all condensed by the time it gets to this first valve it's solid water and it uh, delivers it to this barrel and then I've got a pipe running over this way to deliver it to this barrel if I want I can shut one off and turn the other one on uh, this pipe here is the return condensed steam from my heating radiators out in the front shop and I have them set up so that I can dump the water back into either barrel
and in the winter time I bring in one of my other outside barrels here so I can I can be sure and have at least 150 gallons of water that isn't frozen. This is a setup to machine the uh, exhaust dome and the slide valve. Uh, I'm feeding it crossways and plunging the cutter down to make a, the slot and uh, the radius on the cutter is such that when I get out to my lines here that I described down here, I'll be right about at half inch deep. So <clears throat> the only problem is you got to watch this mill uh, climb milling, and not really climb milling here, but I don't trust it. I've had <laughs> a problem with this. This mill in uh, eighteen. 85 uh, Brown and Sharp offered this in a couple of different models uh, the regular plane model this is a number one the plane model had a uh, uh, a feed screw you know sort of like a bridge port with a handle on both ends pretty normal setup uh, and then they also made a universal model of that where the table would swivel this way so that you could cut spirals if you had a uh, dividing head geared to the uh, the feed and uh, <clears throat> then they offered also this one which is called a production model and it's a rack and pinion feed on the table uh, this screw right here runs the rack and feed back and forth and I think maybe the reason they did that was so that uh, when it fed through a cut, you could crank it back fast rather than have to crank it a whole bunch of times. Uh, this one here, you can get from one end of the table to the other in about maybe four cranks. Uh, so it was kind of a specialized machine. But because of that rack and pinion, this table wants to take off on you and it, if the cutter climbs up on the work. So you always got to feed it toward the direction of rotation. So just to be sure, I put this, and there's no way to lock it. There, there is, I've never found a way to clamp this table down uh, other than maybe tighten the gibs all the way up as tight as you can get them. But, so I made this clamp real quick here to go against the, the end of the table and clamped it down and it seems to be working very well. Uh, what I've done so far is uh, fed the table, loosened that clamp up a little and fed the table one way or the other to keep the space equal on both sides uh, between the cut and my line. And uh, I'm probably about halfway there now.
I don't know if you can see it, but I'm working through a scribe line right there. That's 45 grams. This way, <clears throat> take off excess material and just go along for a ride. If I bring it down, this, this depth here, I still have got 3 eighths of an inch above the fork cut in the bottom. Nine thirty nine. <clears throat> okay, the finished side over here is nine twenty five. So we got fourteen more to go over here.
compound is set here at uh, 45 degrees. Two offset, tobacco boxes offset away from the direction of the feed. Up the feed down at a 45 degree angle. And a little bit more of the 14,000 that we need to uh, come across. Feed it about 15,000 per stroke. I don't know why I just wanted this curved and I just finished it off with a file. I think it looks better. Start out with a coarse file. 
finished it up with a fine file. A little deburring here and there. Got the slide valve set up here in the old uh, Brown and Sharp milling machine and I'm going to undercut a notch out of the ends. Uh, I just drew this on the side so you could see what I'm going to do here.
fit come across that boss there, but these are just rough cuts. Pinion drive on this table on, on this model, uh, the Brown and Sharp, we call it the production model. Getting back to the starting point of view of that. I think this is going to work a little bit better if I take a little less cut and a little faster feed. So I'm going to move it up to the next notch and I'm going to feed it. right where we ought to be right there. Ten under seven hundred. Good enough.
Well, that's how it came out. And the idea is <clears throat> you got these nuts up in here, so there's plenty of clearance down here at the end of the stroke. And you can get your wrench on there, easy to turn them. I think I will take a 45 off of there. Well, even with that and back to about there take that off each side it's just kind of going along for the ride Well, here's the test fit for it. Seems to look like it's fine. It should have plenty of clearance for the nuts. I think we're making some real progress here. <laughs> 